Hello Function Friends, this is Prof G, and once again it's time to get Swifty. In our last lesson we learned all about functions in Swift. In this lesson we're going to use functions to write better code in our You Are Awesome Swift UI app. We'll write one function together that'll improve our app's organization and give you a reusable play sound function that you can use in other apps. And then I'll introduce the concept of refactoring, and you'll complete a challenge on your own, but as always, I'll show a solution right after. Let the Swifting begin! In our last lesson, we got a thorough introduction to functions in Swift. Now let's apply some of that function goodness in our You Are Awesome app. So we're going to create two functions, one to break out our sound playing code. And by doing this, you'll have a function that you should be able to copy and paste into other apps whenever you want to play sounds. And then we're going to create another function that we're going to reuse every time we want to create a non-repeating random. And since we do that three times in our code, we're going to cut down our code that we've rewritten three times. We'll only write it once and then make three function calls. So first, where do we put our functions? Well, these are going to be functions that are inside of content view. And technically, since content view is a struct, those functions are going to be methods of the content view struct. So for view structs like our content view, functions usually go after all of the variable code and then just before the close and curly in the struct. Now, we haven't talked about this much, but watch what I'm going to do with the code folding ribbon. So all of the views that we've written so far, the text view, the image, the button, those are inside of a single V stack, which is returned inside of this body variable. So body is actually something called a computed property. We put all of the stuff with all of our views in it inside this one variable called body, and Swift UI uses that to create our user interface and to update it when anything changes in the user interface. So see how I collapsed everything using the code folding ribbon? I just clicked just to the right of the line numbers on the same line as our var body line. The body code is still there. It's just folded up so that everything between the two curlies is folded and out of the way. Well, everything inside the body variable curlies goes to setting up what's inside the body variable. Or another way to say this, since body is a computed property, all that stuff in the curlies after body is used to compute what's in the property body. By the way, when we refer to properties, we're referring to the constants or the variables that are associated with a type like this struct. So we can write our functions down here just before the close and curly in the content view struct. And if you still don't get the stuff yet about var being a computed property, don't worry about that. We'll cover that more in future lessons. The most important thing to know is if you're going to be adding functions that are part of a struct like this, just put them before the closing curly. Now, first, we're going to create a function called play sound with no parameters. It returns no value. So just before that closing curly, I'll say func play sound lower camel case, open and close parens, open and close curlies. Now, we are going to add a parameter, but we'll do that in just a bit. Then I'm going to expand the code folding, and the code that plays the sound is this chunk of code right here from the start of the guard statement through the closing curly in the catch. So I'm going to highlight all this stuff, cut it out. I'll put in a comment to say call my play sound function here, although it would have been better to use it to do comment. Then I'm going to go back down in between the curlies of play sound, and I'm going to paste it in. Now we get a bunch of errors, and that's because our code doesn't know what sound name is. It's not defined inside of this function, and it doesn't have struct-wide scope, so our function doesn't know that value exists. So if we go up here to our code, what was sound name? Oh yeah, it was this constant that we created here, and we created it just within the curlies of the button action, so it doesn't exist outside of this. So what we should do is we should change our function so that we pass in a parameter, we'll call that sound name and we'll make it a string and we do that simply by updating between the curlies with sound name colon string that's it the error goes away and now that we moved all that code to a different place we've got to remember to call the function that we just wrote so right where I cut out all that code I'm gonna make a call to play sound look at this code completion knows that function exists see the little M next to play sound code completion knows this is a method and it also knows this accepts one parameter that's a string sound name so we'll select this, press return, and for the string that we pass into this function, we can either just pass in the constant sound name that we created up here, or if you wanted to, you can cut out the code to the right of the equal sign, then paste that in as the string that you're passing into the function, and then it's totally okay to get rid of the constant declaration up here. And now every time we press the show message button, the code inside the button action executes, and when we get to this play sound call, our code jumps down here and executes this code. Cool. As long as you import AVF audio and create an audio player property the way we showed, you should be able to copy the play sound function and paste it into any app where you want to play sounds that are stored in the assets catalog. Nice. Well, we've got one more function to write Swifter and that'll be a challenge, but before we do that, we're going to introduce one more concept. So, no one writes pristine, perfectly organized code the first time they sit down at their keyboard. 
everyone goes back through their code and tweaks and reorganizes the code they've written. Now, this process is typically referred to as refactoring. Refactoring is rewriting computer code for more efficiency, readability, and maintainability without altering the underlying results. And most often when you're doing this, you're writing new functions. You're compartmentalizing things that you've done in your code in order to make things better. Now, you'll also hear folks in computer science refer to the concept of DRY, or don't repeat yourself. Now, that's a good tenant to keep in mind when you're looking through your code for refactoring. Am I repeating myself? And if I'm repeating myself in my code, is there an opportunity to break stuff out into separate functions that I can call at places where I was repeating myself? And if I can, this should make my code easier to maintain, smaller, and more readable. Well, we've got an opportunity to do this. If we look at our code, we've got a block of code that generates a new unique message number, a block of code that generates a new unique image number, and a block of code that generates a new unique sound number. And these three chunks of code do nearly the exact same thing. They create a value, generate a random number for that value, compare it to the last value they've used, and if the new random value they've generated is the same as the last one, then they keep generating new random numbers until they come up with a new unique number. Then they update the last random number with the new number that they've got. Now, if we look at the differences between this code, we have different values in the upper bounds of the range that we're considering when we're generating a random number. See the differences? Messages.count, number of images, and number of sounds. Once we generate that random number and we're sure it's not the same as the last number we use, that's what we're using in the while part of repeat while, we assign it to the last number we generated for each of those three values. So we've got an opportunity to write one piece of code where we pass in an upper bound and the last value we use to play a message, an image, or a sound. Then we'll get a new random value and use that new value to update the last value that we played. Then we can call this code three times with the correct values for messages, images, or sounds. Yes, Swift students, it's refactor time. Now, noting this opportunity for refactoring, here's your challenge. Refactor your code, DRY style, creating a new function for generating non-repeating random values. Now, name this function non-repeating random so we can compare our code. The function should have two parameters. One parameter, why don't we call this last number, which represents the last number used for the number you're generating. So, for example, this would be the last message number, last image number, or last sound number, depending on how this is called. And the second parameter should be the value for the upper bounds of the range we use to generate a random number, and why don't we call this upper bounds. And this function should return a new unique random number between zero and upper bounds, and then use this return value to update the last message number, last image number, or last sound number, depending on how and where we call this function. So I think you're up for the task. Pause. Work through it. And when you're ready, resume, and let's compare answers. All right, we see three blocks of code in our button action that are ripe for refactoring. And before I refactor, I'm going to put the last image number and last message number just after the while loop. So all five lines of the code are together in all three of these blocks. They all look alike. So then I'm going to highlight these five lines of code first for what we do with our message number. So I'm going to cut this out and I'm going to use this as a template when we create our new function. And as a reminder, I'll put a comment in here, double slash to do colon, add non-repeating random func call here. So I'm going to head down and I'm going to create our new function just above my play sound function. You could have done it just below the play sound function too. It doesn't matter. Just make sure that you do it inside of the last curly of struct. Then we'll create our new function call func non-repeating random. And the parameters we're passing in are last number colon, which is an int, comma, and our second parameter is upper bound colon, that's an int two. And after the parentheses, we write the arrow because we're passing back an int since we're returning our non-repeating random. And then we'll open and close our curlies. And inside, I'm gonna paste the code that I just copied. And I'm gonna rewrite this code so that it uses the parameter names that I'm passing in. So we have message number in here that we're declaring as the local constant. It's not passed in. We could call this anything we want. I'm just gonna call this new number. And I'll initialize new number in between the repeat curlies. This is where we generate our first random number. And now the upper bound in the random range isn't gonna be messages.count minus one. It's gonna be upper bound, the value that we pass in here. And then the while statement should compare new number to the last number, not last message number. And now remember, we're returning a value, and that should be new number, which is the new non-repeating random value that we just came up with in our repeat loop. So I'm going to paste new number over message number, and then in front, I'm just going to cut this all out, and I'm going to replace that with the keyword return. Then I'm going to scroll up to the button action, and we want to make our new function call where we cut out our old code. And we can do that like this. 
We'll call non-repeating random and look at that. Code completion knows this function exists. It knows that it returns an int. And for the last number, we're going to pass in last message number. The upper bound is going to be messages.count minus one. And remember, this is returning a new non-repeating value. So what we want to do is we want to assign this to last message number. So I'm going to preface this function call with last message number equals. So this is going to give us back a brand new non-repeating value. And we're putting that inside of last message number. Then instead of setting the message string equal to messages in brackets message number, it'll now be equal to messages in brackets last message number. And then we do nearly the same thing for the next two blocks of code. So I'm going to write the function just above var image number here, and I can delete that code in just a bit. So I'm going to say last image number equals non-repeating random, pass in last image number, upper bound should be number of images minus one, remember we're zero indexed. Then I can delete this whole chunk of code and when I update the image name string, I'm going to pass in last image number in between the string and terp. And then finally, same thing, we'll set last sound number equal to non-repeating random, passing in last sound number. And our upper bound is number of sounds minus one. And I can delete this extra code. And when I play sound, I'm going to use last sound number inside the string and terp that generates the string, which is the name of the sound file that we want to play. And then let's try this out. Oh, Swifter, you are a refactoring renegade. So hopefully you got the challenge. If not, fear not. Just go back and review the video until you got this down cold. Keep at it, my Swifty friend. You are acquiring skills.